Um, so, hi, thanks very much for coming. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Lucy Montgomery and I'm the Director of the Centre for Culture and Technology. And welcome to our new uh, rebranded, <coughs> better than ever before, uh, CCAT seminar series. Uh, <laughs> what's that? Do you mind? Oh, <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, as good as it might once have been in the far and distant past. Um, ACAT is the Adventures in Culture and Technology Seminar Series, um, and we picked up where Eleanor left off with their ACAT series, and we have decided to um, give this series another go. And we have the wonderful Shan Shan, who's behind the camera. Um, and Anna Caterina, who's overseas on fieldwork, as our two PhD students who are organising the series. Um, so I'm just going to start by acknowledging the past and present traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, the Noongar people, which I should have done at the very beginning, um, and introducing our first speaker for the series, who is the very distinguished Professor John Hartling who is going to entertain us um, with <laughs> some fabulous critical work on humans and Westworld. So take it away. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank, Thank you very much for coming. <coughs> um, oh, I've got to wear that, have I? Is that right? Yep. Where do I wear it? OK. Um, this is a work in progress. I have not uh, thought about or done this particular thing uh, in, a, in any other forum, so it's it's kind of thinking my way through something. So I hope you'll uh, indulge that, but also possibly help me to um, you know make it go better. However, it does belong to a quite long series. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's a trilogy or a kind of Game of Thrones open-ended <laughs> series that we'll never finish. Uh, but it's a quite long series on what I'm calling, along with some other people, cultural science. So I thought a way to make cultural science work would be to test it out on some contemporary television, and that's what this, uh, this uh, talk is about. It's about uh, not just humans and Westworld, but a cultural science approach to humans and Westworld. And it should work like that. Yes, it does. So first of all, uh, I want to explain why I think cultural science is needed uh, when we have science in one place and cultural studies in another, what's, uh, what's at stake in, in uh, inventing a new subdiscipline or interdisciplinary area called cultural science. And uh, the, the main reason, I think, is because of the, uh, the dawning of global consciousness uh, over the past uh, what might now be maybe 50, 60 years, or perhaps even longer. But during the 20th century, uh, the, it, it was not only the case that trade, uh, economics, and warfare were globalized, uh, but for the first time, people's knowledge of each other, people's connectedness, um, as it were, person to person, and people's uh, media entertainments were globalized. This was uh, perhaps best um, uh, which we say marked by the uh, launch of the uh, satellite Telstar in 1962, which was the first time that live television pictures could be transmitted uh, across the Atlantic. So the, the dawning of global consciousness was very much a technological achievement and quite a recent one. I actually remember Telstar. And um, uh, it, it allowed for television to be understood as a global phenomenon rather than just a natural, uh, national one. However, as we've come to realize, going global doesn't mean everything becomes the same, doesn't become uniform. So the idea that we would all be dominated by some kind of American monoculture has clearly not eventuated. And um, so the, the, it remains to explain how culture, consciousness, media, knowledge uh, can be globalized. What, how does it work? What's the process? What's the system? What's the model uh, for understanding all of that? And I use two of these um, spheres that I borrowed from uh, a, a Russian tradition or a Russian-Estonian tradition of um, uh, both um, science and cultural studies. Uh, I borrowed the idea of the semiosphere from the Estonian-Russian author Yuri Lotman and the idea of the noosphere from uh, a predecessor of his, uh, of Vladimir Vanadsky, 
who also invented the term biosphere. So we're talking about uh, ways in which our planet has not only uh, uh, is not only capable of being studied as a kind of unitary phenomenon, but also how knowledge itself uh, is becoming global and how to think about that. So we start from that. And the, the, the kind of first insight is that uh, if you look at the semiosphere, it's not one sphere of culture around the world. It is more like plate tectonics, where there are points and forces of pressure pushing against each other and creating uh, uh, rifts and divisions, and also volcanism and um, earthquakes uh, at, at points of um, connection. Uh, and this is where new material is formed and where new, uh, la uh, new, new land is generated, in actual fact, in, in the geosphere. And the same goes for the neosphere, the sphere of thought. It's not like everybody's thinking the same. It is much more like global flows, like the atmosphere. Uh, global flows, local tur turbulence, and local intensities. So this is the, the kind of model that we're working from. Uh, what did I do? I think, did I go too far? No, I didn't. Um, in terms of cultural science, cultural science is intending not to start from scratch, but to take two existing fields, cultural studies on the one hand, and the biosciences on the other, and link them in order to find ways of explaining what the other cannot, uh, uh, cannot do easily. So cultural science uses evolutionary and systems approaches to explain culture, uh, which means studying populations rather than individuals or uh, semiospheres rather than individual texts. And it's interested in these borders of turbulence and difference uh, as much as it is interested in uh, the separate um, uh, individual semiospheres or systems. And the same thing goes the other way, that cultural science is not seeking to explain culture away in scientific terms. It's seeking to uh, bring to the attention of the biosciences and the complexity sciences in particular uh, the need to understand language, relationship, reflexivity, meaning, identity, and also communication, context, power, and knowledge, the things that make cultural studies what it is. Uh, this one. How am I doing? Yes. The basic proposition of cultural science is that culture makes groups uh, as an evolutionary adaptation among humans, and that groups make knowledge. Uh, so we don't see culture as something to do with art. We don't see culture even as something to do with whole way of life in the usual sense of that, uh, although it does, uh, it does, you know, that is a description that can be used. We see culture as, a, as a, an evolutionary mechanism for producing human groups where cooperation is possible at greater than the uh, um, extent of kin. So humans are very unusual in that they can cooperate with each other uh, 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 among non-kin and in quite large groups. And it's culture that makes that possible, is the argument, uh, through uh, various mechanisms for establishing trust among we groups and hostility towards they groups. So we have a cultural pattern which we think is very ancient of uh, the uh, division of humanity into we groups and they groups. Uh, and that we know who we are among these groups through language, knowledge, uh, sociality, and relationships of various kinds from which our identity as individuals can emerge. And uh, we know who they are because they talk funny. And they're not to be trusted. And they tell lies. And they want to kill us. Or they want to steal our cattle. And uh, we tell many stories of that kind about various kinds of they, uh, and we have various stratagems for testing their trustworthiness. Like, for example, have they got French accents, that kind of thing. And um, Rob didn't like that, but, you know, it's like, it's, it's why the West cannot accept um, continental theory. It's just mm -hmm. simple. Um, so there are, there are we, they mechanisms for producing uh, communities of trust and communities of distrust, and that is culture's job. It's what it does. So we suggest that, um, although that is the case, the uh, kind of ironic fact is that um, 
new ideas do not emerge from within groups, but between them. New ideas emerge from the clash or conflict or competition uh, or even cooperation between different types of groups. And uh, so if you're interested in the growth of knowledge over long periods of time, epochs, then it's no good looking at one culture. You have to look, about, look at how cultures uh, connect with each other tectonically and how ideas flow from one to another atmospherically. So we suggest that uh, translation, collaboration, competition, clash, conflict, and conquest are all forms of cooperation. Now, conquest as cooperation sounds like you know one of those provocations. <coughs> but in fact, unless communities that are small consolidate into larger ones, they cannot accept uh, competition from uh, uh, others, outsiders, who are better armed than they are. So a lot of the um, ancient history of humanity uh, is, uh, comprises uh, communities forming into states or kingdoms or monarchies of various kinds, which were enlarged sufficiently to be able to absorb attack from the outside. This is a theory of history coming out of people like Peter Turchin, War and Peace and War, and also sociology of um, war and violence by uh, Sinisa Malasevich, a very good um, uh, analysis of how the difference between individual aggression, which does not explain warfare, and organized uh, complexity, which does explain warfare. So suggesting that warfare and conflict are produced by large-scale cultural groups in order to defend themselves against lethal attacks of various kinds. And that's an evolutionary process. Obviously, working hand in hand with technologies, for example, technologies of weaponry. And the same thing applies over in the economy, that uh, economies have grown by producing we and they uh, groups. Uh, among these, although not often discussed, I don't think, uh, are the groups that we know as either slaves or classes. And I put up there the title of a book which uh, makes a history out of that process, suggesting that capitalism and the Industrial Revolution are all uh, based on slavery, and that the, the difference that people um, draw between slave societies and worker societies, or between capitalism and states, is uh, more apparent than real, that the, these things grew up, as it were, in each other's pockets through the history of cotton, interestingly enough. And uh, we, there's also a picture down there which is kind of saving for later, and that is the development of classes in opposition to various forms of uh, complex organization. Uh, what you're looking at <laughs> uh, is another story, the uh, fearless girl uh, standing up to the um, bull, is it the bull market or the bear? Bull market, yes, uh, uh, to, uh, in Wall Street. So that's, a, uh, the, but there's some politics going on around that. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Oh, fearless girl, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, not just Occupy, it's the fearless girl in particular has become a kind of meme. So there's the question of whether we are slaves or classes and what that means in relation to the growth of organized uh, communities uh, of not only we versus they in the external world, but we versus they in our own communities. So conquest is cooperation, conflict is cooperation, and uh, the relations between opposing groups as the process by which new ideas are generated and circulated is where we start from. Uh, I've worked with um, uh, Henry here, and I'm currently working with Lucy as well, on various ways to make cultural science more, uh, less abstract and more uh, applied to particular circumstances. So we've written a book on uh, cultural science, uh, sorry, uh, creative economy uh, based on cultural science, which instead of talking about artists and um, producers, uh, tries to look at the, the creative industries, the creative economy, as a, 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 a process of um, including whole populations, not just the economy, but also culture, and not just elite nations, but also uh, anywhere in the world. So we're trying to look at culture population-wide in the contemporary economic environment. And we find uh, that uh, it's not only necessary to do that, but it's also necessary to uh, accept the challenge of various problems that arise in that context. 
and we've, we've classified these as the three butts. Uh, we haven't got a t-shirt of the three butts, although we do have a t-shirt of the three bigs, don't we? Uh, uh, which are various kinds of divide, various kinds of control, and various kinds of problem of sustainability, various kinds of waste. So that's cultural... Did I do that right? Yes, I did. Uh, that's cultural science as we currently have it. And this is a, an attempt to move beyond uh, analysis of economics and policy towards uh, something that has interested me for a long time, which is fiction. And uh, one of the reasons why I do the humanities is because I've always been interested in drama, always been interested in um, uh, speculative representation as a way of analyzing contemporary problems. And so I want to find some way to bring the issues that I've just tried to outline to bear on contemporary fiction. And this is what I'm doing today. So we have Westworld. Anyone seen it? Good on you. And Humans. Anyone seen that? Oh, thank goodness. Now, I don't know how to do a straw poll, but uh, can I get a sense of whether any of you prefer one against the other? Which, do you, which, which of these did you like watching is what I really want to know. Westworld, West yeah, OK. Nobody else willing to say? <laughs> Nobody's seen both? Uh, and the reason I'm asking is because actually, for me, uh, there is a very clear answer. I loved one, I loathed the other. And I wanted to explain that to myself. I wanted to understand why I detested Westworld so much. <laughs> So now you know. And I also thought Humans is the best thing on television for years. Uh, I used to say when I was... In, yeah, 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 listen to it. Better than the Goonies. Listen to it, yeah. Come on. Listen to it. The, uh, I used to say when I was interviewed on the radio, which I used to be in my younger day, you know, what's the best television program ever made? It was easy to answer. It was Edge of Darkness. Uh, now it's Humans. There we are. So that's what I'm trying to get to. One is detestable. The other is defining a, 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 an epoch. Uh, meantime, uh, we have to think more carefully about fiction. We can't just say fiction is over here and fact is over there. We can't just say the sciences do facts and the humanities do fictions or values or whatever else they accuse us of doing. Uh, we have to try and understand the relationship between fiction and knowledge and the relation between fiction and society. And one of the ways in which I found uh, that to be possible lately is by taking uh, um, uh, notice of the work of uh, Yuval Noah Harari. Has anyone come across Harari? Harari is a historian, a proper historian, you know, the, the kind who actually looks in archives of documents. Uh, and so he, he is entitled to use the word history, which as you obviously understand, keeps as far away from fiction as it possibly can in, under normal circumstances. Uh, one, of the, one of the most hostile uh, um, disciplines to postmodernism, relativism, and all the things that were, have been, you know, um, what's the word, convulsing cultural studies over the past 50 years, simply refused in the, his, in the history discipline. So it's amazing to see this character coming up and saying that the one thing that distinguishes human beings from anything else is fiction. And what he says is that what humans do distinctively is they make things that they live by that do not exist in nature. Uh, and the things they make include, and this is his list, not mine, nations, corporations, religion, crusades, money, and law. And one, one might add also science. These are mental systems, neurosphere uh, artifacts that uh, we, we quite clearly live by in ways that seem imperative. We have no choice. We must live uh, in these fictions. And uh, I, I'm personally drawn to this because uh, I remember getting outraged when I read the American Declaration of Independence. I don't know if any of you have read the American Declaration of Independence, but it bases itself on something called natural law. Natural law is quite clearly a fiction. There's no such thing as natural law. It's, uh, it's an artifact. You know that it is as soon as you read this thing. And yet an entire constitution and then 200 years of subsequent history is founded upon this fiction. So 
uh, it's still with us, the idea of these fictions driving who we are. What is Apple? Actually, Harari doesn't ask that question. He asks the question, what is Peugeot? Which is quite an interesting question. It's a car firm. But what is it? Where does it exist? How can you fall over it? Uh, same goes for big corporations like Apple. Uh, they're, they're, in some senses, non-existent, immaterial constructs, and in other senses, about as real as human life can get in the contemporary period. So uh, I'm interested in fictions in that strong sense, not fictions as escape from the real, but fictions as the things that make the real for this species. And I would like to say that this is not a new idea, even though it's newly expressed by a historian, because culture itself, the processes of culture, the making group processes of culture, has spent quite a few millennia thinking through some problems uh, that uh, fictions are also involved in solving. And that is, um, uh, uh, I, I put it quite simply here, uh, questions about when and where the we community, we, stop. And to get you to think about this, uh, the when we stop is just as interesting as the where we stop. Where we stop? At the borders. Uh, and then we might fight over those borders, we might expand those borders, we might even have to contract them occasionally. It's kind of easy to understand uh, a cultural group in terms of space, uh, although it gets more complicated when you get down to realities. But um, when you think about when are we, that is a really interesting question, because did people live among us? People who have never existed live among us. And people who uh, once were alive or we may even have known uh, remain as actors on social stage long after they're dead. Uh, so, uh, for example, um, people weren't sure whether um, the community included the ancestors or the community included uh, I don't know what you call them, external beings who had never lived, like gods or spirits or whatever the name that, that we kind of give them. And there's a lot of uh, current archaeology organized around uh, the question of um, places like Stonehenge, like um, the uh, Ness of Brodgar in, uh, in um, Shetland, uh, my favorite, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, and lots of other uh, pre-Neolithic, that is Paleolithic or Mesolithic uh, remains, which are quite clearly organized around people collecting together in order to celebrate, to feast, to do something that declares their weeness <laughs> before farming, before cities, before pottery, big stone circles. Uh, remarkable. What were they doing? What were they communicating? And who were they communicating it to? And part of the answer must be they were trying to determine where we stop. Do we stop at the ancestors? Do we stop at people who are alive? How are the two things connected? Uh, that's not gone away. We still have equestrian statues for our leaders who are long dead. Uh, most of you in this room will have heard of dead people who you uh, who are you are required to admire. People like Marx. Uh, you know, etc. Hall, Hawks, John Berger. Uh, they, they stay with us. It's not quite sure, it's not quite clear when people are extant and not extant in terms of their cultural usefulness. So I'm, I'm quite interested in that question of when <coughs> cultures stop, what their borders are in time as well as space. Uh, and uh, I notice that um, uh, scholarship is being devoted to that. Uh, kind of question, that kind of problem too. So where do we stop? When do we stop? How do we know? Uh, uh, I've, I've um, I think I, yes, I've put something that from Matt in there to talk about extinction studies, a very interesting way of thinking about stopping, and also the work of uh, Donna Har uh, Haraway, who is uh, noted for her interest in the relationship between human and non-human uh, going towards machine beings of various kinds. So but that is one of the things that, going back to reality, um, the question of artificial intelligence is not being posed in terms of what can we do with it, but who's willing. If you look at, uh, uh, it's not quite today's, but it's close, uh, March uh, New York Times, 
Uh, they're reporting on evidence that robots are winning the race for American jobs, uh, and uh, that's based on uh, National Economic Review uh, research. And at the same time, Harari himself has written another book uh, in which he's basically suggesting that if you want the history of the future, it is that um, humans are becoming a useless class and that uh, we are, in fact, uh, going to be dissolved into our other at some point in the future. So his, this is the red bit is his writing. He says, organisms are, in actual fact, algorithms. Human beings, giraffes, viruses are algorithms. Uh, they differ from computers only in the sense that they are biochemical algorithms which have evolved in the, at the whim of nat natural selection over millions of years. And uh, those of you who've seen Westworld will remember the um, Anthony Hopkins character saying that uh, evolution is trillions of mistakes. Uh, that's his definition of evolution, trillions of mistakes over a long time. Produces whatever it is that we are now. So uh, that process of um, evolution that is applied to uh, uh, life forms applies equally to algorithms and to artificial intelligence in this view. And in that process, there are sides, there are we and there are they, and they are currently winning. And this is journalism and history, not fiction, I point out. So we need an expanded concept of fiction, as I've mentioned. Uh, and um, that expanded concept of fiction works the other way too. Instead of just saying, well, there's over here is fiction and over here is fact, we can see fiction as a space of experiment in uh, uh, the, the product of new scientific knowledge. So many people will know that uh, the history of rocketry begins not with, uh, is it Tsiolkovsky, Tils, sorry, the Russian rocket uh, maker, but with Jules Verne, who inspired him to invent rocketry, uh, that kind of thing. Science fiction, science, technology, and the growth of knowledge are linked causally, not just analogously. Uh, and in that context, there's been a very interesting and marked uh, change in recent science fiction, which I think of as a kind of feminization. So I've put in a, a little um, nod to one of my own predecessors, I think, Helen, Helen Merrick, who used to be here, uh, who wrote a book which was received as uh, an indispensable social and cultural history of the girls who have, plugged into science, have been plugged into science fiction. And in that context, the extent to which science fiction itself is feminizing, uh, and um, uh, people like Anne Leckie and N.J. Templeman Jemison are producing work that is now winning the prizes that used to be won only by men. So science fiction itself is shifting around and thinking about these questions that uh, I've been trying to raise. So fiction itself becomes an efficient means for exploring possible futures for selves and societies. That's speculative fiction, which we otherwise might know as history and for uh, the growth of knowledge itself, which is science and science journalism. Uh, fiction is also being increasingly used in formal knowledge itself. So you have fictor criticism, uh, Stephen Meekie does that. Uh, you have uh, scenarios in science, possible futures and counter futures. Uh, you have storytelling as absolutely normal nowadays. And what Yuval himself, um, what, uh, sorry, Harari himself calls um, the history of tomorrow, which is a contradiction in terms, of course. <laughs> so fiction extends knowledge by its own particular methodologies. These include, okay, uh, these include narration, plot, character, and conflict. Um, uh, uh, so uh, narration is going on too long here, apparently, so I, I, there's also the question of economy of time. Um, so if you're seeking to understand agency and context and causal sequence in complex evolving systems, then storytelling, narration, plot, character, and action are uh, among the means that we use to understand those things. Meantime, how do you work up from fiction to whole-scale populations and uh, global societies? The traditional means for doing this, and I'm saying traditional, in a very kind of truncated sense, it's only been traditional since about 1955 or so, is television, uh, which is where I came in. Uh, television was 
noted in the 50s, 60s, and 70s for the work that the medium did, popular television entertainment, the work that the medium did in producing the kind of modern subject, the subject of modernity, the, the private household, the consumer, the, uh, as it were, the, the American housewife model of uh, being modern, uh, one who is secular, uh, who is uh, uh, involved in family um, uh, reproduction, and so on and so forth. Uh, sort of stuff that Lynn Spiegel studied so well in her work. So television was the place where the modern subject, the subject of contemporary consumer capitalism, is uh, narrated, represented, uh, and to some extent taught. Uh, but that kind of uh, television is no longer with us, as you know. And so uh, we have to rethink what it is that television is doing. And we have to rethink how fictions are being scaled up to society level. So that's part of the task uh, of what I'm trying to do now. And I've, asked, I've changed the question around from how do you produce the modern subject, the kind of docile consumer, to uh, what does it mean to be human in an era of power? Uh, and I think that's the original cultural studies question, still is, uh, except that it needs now to be posed differently uh, through speculative TV drama, for example, where, I'm quoting Harari again, um, modernity is a deal, he says, the entire contract can be summarized in a single phrase. Humans agree to give up meaning in exchange for power. So his answer to the question, what is it to be human uh, in an era of power, is that we abandon meaning. We become meaningless in ourselves. We're just algorithms. And we have no meaning in our lives because we're after power. <coughs> At last, I hear you cry, you can see some pictures. Now this. Does this work? Yes, it does. Is Westworld. Uh, I am sure you'll agree it's a really good example of one of those instances, they're quite common, where the trailer's much better than the series. Um, so, oh, wrong way, sorry. Go back. Now, this is um, season one of Humans.
So that's what we're talking about. Um, I want to bring in the concept of the Anthropocene at this point, uh, but it will just float off to the side, uh, possibly, because it's too big to develop in the time available to me, which I gather has just run out. Um, so I'll press on very quickly and say, what are the kinds of questions that cultural science can ask in relation to these fictions? And the questions might be, what are the limits of the human? Where do we stop? Where do they begin? What is consciousness in an age of automation? What is the relationship between self or identity and society or group at planetary scale or species scale? Uh, what happens when computational, computation knows more than humans do and how can uh, artificial intelligence systems balance meaning and power? And the questions are going to be answered by comparing the two shows. So you'll see uh, shortly that I make a distinction uh, between two what look like binary oppositions, Westworld humans. But they're not binary. They're in a Venn diagram relationship where there is overlap and contrast, excuse me, and possibly even conflict. But where what we're looking at is a universe that has both of them in it. And so we're sort of um, understanding the identity of each by looking at the other. Uh, and so uh, going back to the we and they model, uh, I've uh, put on the um, first of the Venn diagrams that on one side we have we, which is the place of universal truth, and on the other side we have they, which is the place of ad adversarial distrust. And in between, we have a translation zone of both newness, new ideas, and conflict. And that we can um, inspect the two series through this lens, or these lenses. So, narratives of newness in the two areas also reflect uh, oppositions in the critical domain. And I've gathered some of these oppositions into two sets, what I call builders and breakers. On one side, we have creative productivity. On the other side, we have creative destruction. That's Schumpeter. On one side, we have institution building. On the other side, we have critique, opposition to institutions. So we have capitalism, we have Wall Street. On, the, on one side, we have growth and power. On the other side, we have novelty and change. That's artistry, originality, that kind of stuff, avant-garde. On one side, we have economics, boo. And on the other side, we have cultural studies, hooray. Okay? Uh, however, the whole point of this model is that you can't have one without the other, and you can't make new ideas without the clash between these two opposites. So clash, conflict, competition between these systems is the source of newness and innovation, and that newness that we value emerges from these differences. So hold your hostilities for a moment. And we will go to the, us and the, the, the two sides of the two shows. So asking questions of the two shows, what semiosphere do they come from? Well, uh, the national and cultural semiotic traditions that produced each of them are very distinct. Uh, humans comes from Europe. The original series uh, was called Real Humans, came from Sweden. I haven't seen it, so I can't talk to you about it. But it was remade by Channel 4 in the UK. Uh, so it's a strictly European phenomenon. Whereas Westworld is very clearly uh, an American show coming out of an American tradition, including that of Hollywood, a, a, a film with um, Yul Brynner in it. Back in the 70s, I think, wasn't it? Or 80s? I can't remember. 70s, yeah, old time. Just don't smoke. Um, what did I do? I, uh, I think I've missed, I've gone too far, haven't I? Yes. Uh, the question, what is the problem? Uh, the problem at system level, at population level, at uh, planetary level, what is the problem? And I'm going to say that in the American semiosphere, the, the unresolved social anxiety and running sore of history is slavery. Whereas in the European tradition, the unresolved social anxiety and running sore of history is class. Uh, if you get nothing else out of this talk, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it's a battle between slavery and class. Uh, and at individual uh, character level, uh, the unresolved problem of culture, meaningfulness, is in Westworld, power in humans, meaning. 
Now, I've also put some pictures up there which somewhat complicate the issue. You'll see the top row is slavery, where girls are sold into slavery uh, uh, to alarming effect. And at the bottom one, you see um, Victorian London, where girls are sent to uh, factories uh, with alarming results. And the uniting figure in both of those schemes is cotton. So, what character characterization? What are the characters about? The driver of character's motivation in most world is individualism, greed, wealth, the other as ant. In humans, it's mutuality, love, family, law, the limit of sociality, and the, uh, and, and the obligations of each to the other. The most important character, the one who achieves consciousness in each of the two shows, is not entirely clear, because it's not only these two, but uh, we are invited to perceive what's going on through Dolores in um, uh, Westworld and uh, Anita, who becomes Mia in Humans, Gemma Chan. Uh, there are other things to say about that, but I haven't left myself enough time, so never mind. What is the relationship that is depicted to represent these connections among humans and among not humans? Well, in Westworld, it's sex, a transmission model of relationship where you can have whatever you want, particularly if you're a bloke. Uh, whereas in humans, it's love or translation. So I'm making a distinction between transmission relationships and translation relationships, difference between sex and love, that's the names they're given, uh, where newness is produced out of difference. In Westworld, the relationship is death, you win or lose. In humans, the relationship is compromise or accommodation. You learn, you tolerate, uh, and so on. Furthermore, as uh, Eleanor knows, uh, relationships with robots is not confined to uh, the kinds of things that we're talking about here, human-looking robots. There are other kinds of robots with whom we have relationships. And there are also other kinds of beings with whom we are said to have relationships. Uh, the most famous one at the moment is Beast, uh, as long as it's loved by Emma Watson. So, um, <laughs> control myself. Uh, what's at stake? The reveal. Uh, what, hap what happens at the end? Catastrophe in Westworld, a catastrophe that costs $100 million. That's some catastrophe. But you can see it in the trailer, can't you? The money's on the screen. It's beautiful. Everybody's dead. Um, in humans, it, oh, sorry, that was a spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler alert, yes, sorry. I, I meant to do that earlier. <laughs> Oops. Uh, in humans, it's compromise. Uh, it's only a $12 million, million, dollar, uh, million dollar, but so, sorry, I beg your pardon, 12 million pound budget for series one. I don't know what series two cost. Uh, but uh, it's not uh, designed around the uh, um, risk of control or death. It's designed around humanness reinterpreted. Uh, humans and non-humans living together despite what they know about the other. So that picture of uh, the family, um, it's, it, they're called the, uh, what are they called? The Hawkinses. The Hawkins family is at the center of humans. And uh, the one that well, used to be called Anita is now called Mia. The synth uh, starts in, in their um, domestic environment as a domestic servant and ends up as a conscious uh, being. And this moment is when the mother, who is also a lawyer, recognizes that fact. So the resolution is winning in Westworld and cohabiting in humans. What about the robots? Well, the perspective of, the, um, uh, of robotics that the series explores, again, comes down in Westworld to power, what, that of the owner, the controller, or the producer, known in that particular fiction as Ford or Anthony Hopkins, uh, the big name actor in the series. In humans, it's what I think of as the, the uh, perspective of the user. We see the first robot in a household, in a family, in suburbia in a recognizably present-day uh, environment. Uh, whereas the um, Westworld um, production design is all corporate steel and glass and gray and blue and uh, an entirely fictional landscape uh, that comes straight out of Westerns, obviously, uh, and does not exist in the world that the guests actually belong to. So the perspective uh, differs. What do the robots think when they think? Well, 
Uh, the first thing that robots do in Westworld is to make a decision, a decision to be free. It's a freedom discourse. But the first thing that robots do when they think for themselves in humans is that they think they're a class. Uh, the, um, the Niska character, who you haven't seen before, uh, Emily Barrington, the blonde person at the bottom there, uh, is, uh, starts out as a, a sex worker uh, um, synth and ends up as the kind of rebel leader. Uh, and the first thing that she thinks of, when she thinks, is how to connect with others and put together a rebel organization. So those, that's the difference between the two. What's the general pattern then? Those three pictures at the bottom tell the story. Uh, in my view, Westworld is a fiction of breakers. Humans is a fiction of builders. It, the first tests individuals and to destruction. So the in, only interest it has in children who are treated very interestingly in Westworld. You should look at the children. They never, they kill them, but they don't kill them kind of beautifully. They're just kind of, you know, off camera. Uh, but um, the, the one occasion when they do dissect a human child beautifully, this is what it looks like. It's a function of the will of the proprietor. Uh, and the face does that, as you can see. Whereas uh, the role of the child in humans is to welcome the other into the family, into the context, into the circumstances. It's the Sophie character. Uh, who accepts the humans, the uh, synths, sorry, for what they are, and uh, becomes the kind of agent of familiarization. And in between them, there is Mia herself, now Mia, not Anita. Uh, she's Anita when she's blue and Mia when she's red. I don't know why. Uh, and um, that is her experiencing love. And I just need you to know that the background, <laughs> thank you, uh, Eleanor knows what's coming because she follows me on Instagram. Uh, is where I grew up, in Westgate-on-Sea in Kent, the least charismatic part of England that you could possibly imagine. It is Dagsville. It is John Clark Rick Large. And there she is, becoming human in that environment, not in a kind of um, charismatic corporate environment. It's a very um, different take on what we're trying to discuss. Oops. So, coming back to reality, we discover that fiction is now, well, not only weaponized by one side of politics, but uh, being resorted to by the other side of politics in order to work out what the hell is going on. So how did we get to the American um, election result and the Trump presidency? Um, the, the apparently, sales of uh, 1984 of, um, excuse me, a brave new world, and of it can't, it can't happen here, of course it can, uh, uh, has soared since Trump became president. People are trying to understand what the hell is going on in politics by reading classic science fiction. And furthermore, uh, journalism is telling us that um, uh, politics is made of the weaponization of fiction. Fantastic term, I think. So again, we have to draw conclusions from what we're looking at in these TV shows and try and bring them back to the wider cultural context. Uh, there's an old question in British TV, British politics, and uh, uh, popular culture, what about the workers? And um, so the question of class remains. We know that the synths are workers. They are domestic servants, sex servants, that kind of thing, uh, in, uh, in humans. And we know that the... Um, what are they called? The hosts, is that what they're called in, in Westworld? Are slaves. They do what they do because they have to do it. Um, so leaving the slavery side of it aside for one moment, what about class? Uh, and what I'm trying to do with these ideas is to apply this typology that I'm developing out of those shows in my own work on knowledge groups uh, to show how new communities may be forming themselves, gaining consciousness, un understanding themselves as part of global developments which work at that kind of atmospheric neurosphere level as well as uh, in uh, different um, cultural settings. Uh, and so we can think through how new groups are forming themselves uh, by looking at these kinds of oppositions. And one example, maybe, haven't thought it through properly yet, girls. 
So I've been working with my daughter on a paper which uh, I should be giving at the ICA in a couple of weeks' time, but I won't because I'm not going, uh, on girls as objects of knowledge. And one of the conclusions we come to is that girls are forming themselves into something like class consciousness through celebrity, through media, uh, and through social media. And so there's a way of thinking about the formation of new groups, the production of newness out of conflict, and uh, the relationship between what we've previously thought of as not defining or representing the human, that is girls, and uh, new forms of consciousness. Uh, which is also there. So we can use this model to think through other problems, is what I'm suggesting. New, form, new knowledge formations, which are organized around individuality in Westworld, but around groups in humans, which is why I like humans more. Uh, new groups, what perspective? Is it that of the owners and producers, or is it that of the consumers and users? Uh, again, the two series give us different uh, points of view. And when we go back to the Anthropocene and start thinking about that time, uh, we have to think about Anthropocene labor. Are we looking at slaves or are we looking at classes? Is purposeful action, is it Niska or is it uh, Maeve? Uh, is it winning or is it adapting and cohabiting? Uh, one of the things that distinguishes the Niska character who starts out as a sex slave, sex worker, sorry, ends up as a rebel leader is that she's uh, uh, claim to be, um, I've got it here somewhere, um, <coughs> yes, she's claimed to represent the best queer subplot on TV this season, according to a leading feminist uh, and um, uh, uh, blog. So the Niska Astrid sub subplot is a, is a plot about how to have difference in sexuality, difference in relationship, uh, represented by the very person who's uh, struggle is to uh, escape the conditions of their production, so cohabiting. Uh, again, is it about power or is it about meaning? This is the question, and this question for you to choose. If you like Westworld, you are choosing individualism, control, ownership, death, and slavery. And if you're interested in humans, well, of course, everything's fine. <clears throat> what about the Anthropocene? I haven't got time to go through it, uh, but. Uh, the consequences of planetary consciousness and self-knowing have become a really big issue in, I think, philosophy. So here, for example, is Sloterdijk, uh, who I still haven't read properly, but it, it, somewhere in there, you know, globes, foam, bubbles, is that right? Are they three different books? I think they are. I'm looking at Matt. Uh, is really thinking through similar issues to the ones we're discussing, but in a philosophical manner, and he says, the coming of the term Anthropocene inevitably obeys an apocalyptic logic. It indicates the end of any peace of mind in the cosmos on which historical forms of human being in the world rested. In other words, the Anthropocene is catastrophe. It's end. It is lack of control. It is uh, something awful. The end of peace of mind, that's what it is. Um, but maybe it isn't. If you look at the Anthropocene through the lens of humans, then maybe it's compromise, translating across boundaries, and using translation zones to bring opposites closer together. The human technology opposition, the human animal or environment opposition, and the knowledge fear opposition. So finally, we have to say, what does translation mean in this concept, context? I've said translation between human and non-human, translation meaning uh, a way of representing love as opposed to uh, sex, but Lotman, Yuri Lotman, the semi semiotic theorist, sees translation as a much more complex process than simply transmitting uh, uh, an information unit across a boundary. He sees it as having five stages, and what I've done just to show you how this might work is to change the word text in his writing to the word robot, uh, in order to show that the whole thing just works, because Lotman is a genius, as you all know. And uh, you really don't need any other theorist, uh, as I'm sure you'll agree later on. Um, so it starts out with strangeness. The robot consciousness is valuable because it's unknown, or the text is valuable because it's in a strange language. It's unknown. It's valuable because it's foreign. Transformation. This is the period when the robot and the home culture begin to restructure each other. They accommodate. 
The robot consciousness offers a chance to break with the past, spurring local experimentation. If you look at the Laura character in Humans, that's absolutely her narrative arc. She turns from hating Anita, it's a machine, we don't want it in the house, to the hug at the end of series two. A very important arc. Uh, and translations, imitations, and adaptations, new kinds of robot, new kinds of artificial intelligence proliferate. Then there's the period of abstraction, which is that it's not the individual robot or the individual text that's important, but the codes and um, uh, uh, rules that um, produce a particular kind of textuality that are important. And we begin to look at them. So we look at the algorithms, not the skin. Finally, there's a period of productivity when the local culture produces new and original robot consciousness, previously peripheral robotic intelligence, becomes core to hum humanness, and we develop innovation in what it means to be human from the margins, resulting in the, the final period, the turn-taking, the dialogic turn-taking. Instead of receiving a text from the outside or a robot from the outside, we transmit back into the world. A flood of robot consciousness crosses the human-machine border uh, to transform the world, which is the kind of... Uh, Haraway position, I think. I don't know. Um, we may talk about that. So what I'm really trying to say is that if you're thinking about how large-scale systems transform through conflict and connection between opposi op oppositional and untranslatable units, then this model works as much for thinking about robots and artificial intelligence as it does for textuality and culture. So... As somebody said, let the games begin. Let the interaction between the human, the non-human, the human and the beast, the human and the Anthropocene, uh, begin. And it's beginning in popular culture, not in science, and certainly not uh, in the kind of formal stuff that we tend to look at. So I just picked, almost at random, uh, out of uh, my feeds something from Chill Out Point, which is, you know, a place to stick your stuff. Uh, somebody writing, I think they're German, so the grammar's a bit odd. It happens so that people and robots go together in this life, side by side. In some spheres of life, they are even interchangeable. And who knows into what this opposition, human and robots, will translate? That is the question of our times. And it's being answered on social media. Thank you. Oh dear, I'm sorry. No, no, it's all right. Um, it's one o'clock. I mean, Let's say we started late. No, well, we're going through till 1.30. Um, so if anyone needs to duck out, then it's okay. Um, have some fruit before you go. Um, but if anyone's got any questions? Questions? We've got half an hour for discussion. Yeah, I haven't seen most of all, but... I'm looking at that, I don't really want to look at it. See it now, I probably, probably should see it. I really enjoy humans, but I haven't caught up with the most recent episodes. One, one almost a turning point in the first episode, it appears to me, is the episode where the male character has sex with Mia. Yes. And that's when, after that, the, the female, uh, Laura, starts to, well, that's the way the narrative develops. But that, that's interesting. There are, Issues of uh, gender relationships in that because there's another, another robot with the other character, the, 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 the robot that's not functioning, the robot and has to be taken away. And, uh, yes. Richard, Richard, uh, her John Hurt, isn't it? Yes. That's quite interesting. Too, yes, so yes. What do you make of the gender relations in there? I, I make a lot of them, uh, and in particular the point you mentioned, which is that the, uh, the Anita character, Gemma Chan, is brought into a household and the husband basically rapes her. Uh, secretly, without everybody else knowing, he just kind of helps himself, can't help it, he's a bloke. Uh, and uh, you see that, and it is instantly, uh, like, it may be compulsive, but it's quite clearly against the rules. He's broken, uh, he's broken something, possibly his marriage. We are not invited to celebrate uh, what he's doing, as opposed to what happens in Westworld, where uh, humans raping robots is precisely the point of the, of the game. 
So it is extremely important that they're trying to set up a notion of uh, ethics-bound relationships among people and people, people and robots, robots and robots. And at quite a lot of points, it's hard to tell which is which, because the robots behave better than the humans do half the time, and um, the, uh, the uh, ethical choices are being made across the board. So you think there's a danger of uh, having such beings in one's house. What's it going to do to the children? So the Sophie child that you may have just seen in one of my slides uh, begins to behave very strangely. She begins to go robotic. Uh, in her own actions. She wants to be a robot. She wants to grow up like Anita. Uh, and they have to work through that storyline. The, the mending of the marriage after that episode has to be thought through, and it is thought through. The relationships of love have to be understood not to be just the nuclear family, but many other possibilities, including the one of Niska that I mentioned. Uh, there's a very interesting relationship between a robot and a policeman. Uh, which, and you don't know it's a robot to begin with. So there's a lot going on there in the representation of relationships, which becomes the point of the series, it seems to me, that that's what it's thinking through. How do you accommodate to other? Uh, when, when in our society, other, othering is done to women, minors, uh, you know, queer and gay people, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a way of thinking through those issues in our contemporary environment. Anyone else? Thanks, Ron. Great talk. It wasn't meant. It was meant to indicate why some people have irrational hatred of uh, continental philosophy. Um, my question is why groups or what is a group? Um, put it another way. Okay. Yes, it does, and it's a proper question. Uh, and it's a question I can't yet answer because I haven't thought through what I mean by groups. One thing that seems clear is that the position that Jason Potts and I got to in the book called Cultural Science, uh, which was that culture makes groups that we call deans, that is, interbreeding subpopulations of a larger scale species, uh, uh, which are connected and unified by common language, common customs, common um, trustworthiness tests uh, is too big for quite a lot of groups that are agentful in contemporary life especially. It may have been then too, hard to know. Uh, because even then there were sexual divisions of labor and other kinds of division of labor that, that we probably know less about than we should do. But it's quite clear that uh, the kind of agencies of knowledge production are not simply demon-sized, tribe-sized, nation-sized groups. They're much smaller. So we've come through with a different solution to that problem, which is that there are such things as deans, which are culture-formed groups united by language, ideology, and um, uh, the various codes, various tests, <laughs> uh, which our government is currently um, legislating, as you know. Uh, but also that there are things that we call knowledge clubs, which are purposeful groups intending to change current arrangements into something else. And uh, uh, there's quite a lot to say about that, but just to answer your question, uh, I don't think that a group is just a group is just a group. I don't think it's a, it's a 
an aggregate of things that you can decompose into individuals and say, well, it's just that writ large. But also, I don't think that groups are, are identifiable by their um, even their common language or, their, or, or, or any of those kind of collective uh, characteristics that people ascribe to them. Because when you, get, when you do decompose down into smaller units, no group um, demonstrates just those characteristics. It demonstrates lots of others. So, for example, one of the great singularities of our time, conceptually, is a thing called China. And uh, the West has a view of China, which is reversed in, in journalism ad nauseum, uh, that has to do with different ways of thinking from what then turns out to be America, uh, or the universe, and then there's China. Uh, so the, the, we, we see China in a singular way, the we being the West. But also China does too. You know, Chinese characteristics, there's always an exception. China does things differently. We're not the same as everyone else. As if there was one thing called China. Well, China in the West, China in the, on the coast, they're slightly different things, I should say. Quite profoundly different things in many ways. China now, China 20 years ago is not the same. Uh, China young people, China old people, not the same, etc. China rich, China poor. So I'm, well, I'm agreeing with you that you can't just say groups and leave it at that. You have to understand what we're trying to do with the concept of group is to show that it is the generator of new knowledge. Groups are only understandable as uh, the, wa the, pl the ways in which and the places where culture preserves, transmits, and spreads, disseminates knowledge. So evolutionarily, Culture is a way of forming groups that can survive mammoths, uh, as it were, and at the same time pass on knowledge that can't be inherited genetically. You can pass it on through stories, you can pass it on through technologies. So culture is the means to do that. But you only pass them on to your group, you don't pass them on to oppositional groups. That would be a risky thing to do. So it's that sense of group that we're trying to understand. Groups that are forming new knowledge around contemporary problems and solutions and uh, innovating through difference from existing uh, categories and distinctions. So there's a group that perhaps you can consider the sites and those functions rather than collectivism? No, no, I don't think anything is a collective of an individual. I think individualism, the individual, the thing that we think of as the separate entity, is a product of culture. I don't think it's an agent. That, that's an axiom of cultural science, that individuals come last, not first. And that if you think you're an individual, you're thinking in English, you're thinking with the context that you occupy and the relationships that you have and the codes and whatnot that you see the world by, uh, which you might call ideology, uh, they come first. Uh, and so how individuals act in the world becomes a stake in what group do I belong to and should it prevail? How should it connect with its neighbors? Uh, how should it survive competition and attack from the outside? More. I didn't say at all, I said last. Oh yes, very much so. We think that um, we, we don't think there has been ever a human being that has not, li not lived in more than one deem, uh, which are kind of naturalistic groups formed by language, culture, and place, position, whatever it may be. So that, you know, if you're a child in a pre-modern um, group, clan, whatever, uh, you are also gendered, you are also, are you a warrior, are you not a warrior, you know, are you a hunter, are you a gatherer? There's all kinds of kind of banal questions you can ask about each individual's position in the group, but you can't understand that person without the group. Yeah, groups are very often teleological. They have purposes, and we think that that's where we think knowledge clubs come in yeah, when people. That's why that was the yeah. Knowledge yeah. 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 Yeah.
deans, yeah. Well, deans are a worry because I haven't got a language for them that doesn't sound all tribal and ridiculous. And, you know, it's, it's absurd and I don't want to go there. But nevertheless, culture is doing something with groups through codes and I'm trying to understand what that is. Uh, we think that, um, Jason and I think, that uh, the history of the growth of knowledge is the history of number of deans per, post, per person increasing exponentially since Neolithic times to now, uh, often uh, associated with the development of various kinds of communication technology. So you can belong to more deans if you can communicate at a distance than if you can only communicate face to face and more again if you can do it by print, and more again if you can do it electronically. So the history of the development of communication technology is the history of individuals having access to more and more deans, more and more potential groups, which eventually end up not as um, produced by lines of descent, family, and, uh, and you know, the, the kind of obligations of a, of a, of a society, but uh, almost voluntary affiliation. So you have people like Henry Jenkins, who became who he is, because he watched Star Trek as a child. And in the country he came from, which is Georgia, um, that is the state of Georgia, uh, you know, he couldn't be what he wanted to be uh, in, the, in the community in which he lived. But he could once he watched Star Trek. That's what I'm talking about. Matt. So, um, question from behalf of the Bregans. <laughs> I did. Um, That's because I'm a neoliberal, you know that. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> well, we, we can certainly discuss that. I'm worried about, so in terms of culture science as, the, as using evolutionary complexity and systems theory approach to understanding culture, um, so from that builder side, um, whereas lots of traditional Theory or cultural studies has uh, wanted to, you know, draw ideas from history of philosophy of science, which uh, uh, look suspiciously at those sorts of projects. Indeed. Um, and so I'm just wondering about how much room there is in the way you are uh, practicing cultural science for both sides of that. Yep. Um, like you could think of some critiques of the application of evolutionary science in that, you know, that would argue that, for example, the language of algorithms is just a, a, another way of mechanising life, yep. um, which we can see in history of science talking about uh, animals and people as machines. It's the latest form of cotton, I understand. Yes. Yeah, um, or the, all the ideas in sort of the popular type ones that all this talk about genes and war and, you know, uh, in the history of life is a projection of certain very specific historical cultural uh, understandings of, of war yep. and so on, and saying the language of population and all that. So I'm just wondering whether you see there be a dialectical possibility between those things there or, or, or how solid the scientific, the science of cultural science. Yes. It's, a, it's the best question in the sense that I know that I'm in the middle of, you know, like a an atmospheric turbulence that is liable to blow me away in any direction at any point. Uh, and so the best way I can answer your question is by saying that I think I'm mostly talking to scientists or people from the social sciences who have been brought up on methodological individualism and who don't think about culture or groups or meaning or relationship or ideology or Baudrillard very often. And if they do, what they think is, oh, that was all solved in the 1990s by SoCal. It's all rubbish. Uh, and so my quarry is not postmodern theory, my query is methodological individualism, especially of the psychological kind that is now absolutely dominant uh, across many different domains, including the biosciences. So, you know, Steven Pinker is one thing and I'm another, and, you know, that's, that's an issue that I think needs addressing. So that's one answer, that it's a disciplinary call from one area to another. Uh, at the same time, I'm very well aware of the fact that my position in cultural studies is not accepted by many people in cultural studies. They have conducted me to the door and closed it firmly behind me. 
Uh, and so a lot of what I'm trying to do in cultural science doesn't count as cultural studies. I can see that because people think that, oh, we're just giving up all the critical uh, ground gained during the era of postmodernism. And not only that, but we're kind of assisting the development of global co uh, corporatism and capitalism by things like creative industries. It's a very familiar discourse, um, which I resist. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a trained structuralist. I come out of that tradition, and that's where my heart lies. But how do you make that tradition count in a larger environment where science, economics, and policy are run by methodological individualism? That's the, that's the kind of teleological question, the push question. And it's not done by saying, well, we'll just carry on criticizing until you go away, because it doesn't happen. So that's, that's you know, it's like a personal, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, it's, a, it's a choice that I've made which recognizes that most of what cultural studies does and has done since the 1970s does not count outside of cultural studies. It has no purchase on policy, no purchase in science, and no purchase in popular writing at all. We are not known, what we say is not cared for, and if anybody notices it, they say, you know, name-calling things about it. So that's why I started the way I did. If you can't beat them, join them. Uh, on the other hand, I have said, and I, I mean it sincerely, that you have to grow knowledge out of the opposition between these two areas. So. There is builder, there is breaker, and breakers are important. Schumpeter was a breaker, uh, understood this very well. Uh, Hayek was a, probably a builder rather than a breaker, you know. But you've got to understand in the history of ideas how uh, um, one knowledge paradigm can become rigid and controlling and fascist, even when it was radical in its youth. Uh, and needs to be replaced, needs to be renewed. So science needs to accept criticism in ways that it doesn't understand, not just in ways that it does understand and can tolerate. And I think that, that position is still true. Uh, so of course there is room for critique and for uh, you know, refuseniks, as, it, as they used to be called, in, in the domains of knowledge. Um, but I also think that you have to go beyond that. You have to think, well, what are we trying to make this criticism in the name of what are we trying to turn this world that we don't like into? Uh, what, are we, what institutions will replace the ones that we're criticizing? What kind of institutions are produced by the forces at work as we observe them and as we conceptualize them? And how can we turn such institutions towards uh, processes that we admire? And Derrida is the warrant for that. He doesn't talk about globalization, but he does talk about mundialization, in which that is the goal. The goal is to rethink uh, contemporary global uh, activism. And so, uh, you know, that in the middle of all that, Maelstrom is what I'm trying to do. It's like I know there are, uh, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm often um, over apologetic about uh, the politics of the position that Jason Potts and I adopt because it's easily dismissed as mere liberalism or neoliberalism or whatever people want to say, name calling. But we think that there's something at stake which has not been thought through, either in science or in culture, but can be through the encounter of the two. Possibly by better minds than mine. So come on. <laughs> yeah, but I, I've got another question about the groups. Uh, I've, I've been struggling to understand cultural science for quite a while now. We do quite a few talks. Well, I'm getting a little bit closer to it. Good. I'm still, I'm still, I still feel away from grasping it. So well, you I'll can't be. Up. You can't be. Because you like humans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just to start off with saying, culture makes groups. Uh, that, that one throws me. Because um, culture, I, I, I would say culture is the repertoire of meanings and symbols yes. uh, that, that people use to make groups. Yep. Okay, so this just that word has thrown me in the first instance. Read Pagel. Who? Uh, Mark Pagel, P-A-G-E-L. Okay. Wired for Culture, 2012. That's where we got the idea from. Okay, good. Um, have you thought about the idea of ritual in there? It's a code. It's for, it's organising we groups. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is what Carson and Phil talks about. Yeah. 
Yeah, and he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> just, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it struck me that, you know, when he's talking about China, he's talking about the, the significance of ritual in organizing relationships between people. That, that extends also to the relationships that we have, not necessarily as groups, but with, with people. So I'm a supervisor of and you're a supervisor, you're a, you're a lecturer, you're a farmer, you're a brother. Sure. Everyone has relationships. Yep. But these are not necessarily group relationships. Really? They're based on, on a way of acting. As a, the way I act as a supervisor is subject to certain protocols of how I should act. Mm. The way I act as a husband is different. So the, the, the relationships really? are bound by certain kind of ritual, ritual form. So I just think it's an interesting concept to... Uh, one, one of the uh, pleasures of our times is watching people stumble over that particular problem and uh, acting in one domain, forgetting what they might want to be in another and turning into Bill O'Reilly. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, in other words, secularization of the work environment. Uh, it, it, whatever. You know, there are so many examples, all blokes. Um, the, 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 the idea that we can categorize who we are as individuals and then act that individualism in a different environment doesn't hold up. It's, it's, uh, it, you know, I, I, I do not start from that position, even though I recognize that that's how it might be experientially understood, you know, moment to moment by people involved in activities. Uh, the, 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 um, the ritual side of ritual strikes me as a much bigger thing. Uh, I was just reading um, Anthony Fung and um, Jerome de Cloet's book on um, China, where they talk about the exam that folk take, whose name, what's it called? You've all taken, yeah, the Gao Kao, yeah. That's a ritual that people go through in the, in the group-making processes of knowledge. And I'm much more interested in that, how are groups and knowledge uh, connected. And uh, it's not completely distinct from ways that those things are brokered in other countries. Uh, you know, everybody goes through exam processes of various kinds of selection processes. But how we conduct ourselves, comport ourselves, in professional environments where knowledge is the product is highly ritualized and it's all entirely organized around group identities rather than individual purposes. Uh, why universities are so hard to work for because they have all kinds of processes that just simply don't connect with what we think we're supposed to be doing in relation to the production of knowledge. Uh, and they're connected with things like prestige or excellence or credentialism rather than I want to find stuff out. You know, it's like it's not a simple matter of saying this is my purpose. I will go and con I will go and conduct my life in that, in service of that purpose. It is I have to work through institutions, and they produce codes which I have to obey in order to get where I want to get to. So groups first, individuals after. Why not? I mean, this is Why groups rather than because I think groups are bigger than institutions. I think groups are population-wide. Uh, and I also think evolutionarily, they precede institutions, or at least as far as we can tell. You know, there's always that. But uh, uh, groups appear to be the, m the means by which humans are gathered in order to survive during the early period of uh, you know, um, human history, prehistory. Uh, and that they did it with art, language, tool making, and clannishness, uh, and also mobility, that has to be said, uh, in ways that uh, precede institutions like government and the state and the fictions that Harari talks about. They, they're evolutionarily distinct. It's the same thing that Matt was asking about, about you know, um, warfare and such like. Uh, w warfare does appear to be an evolutionary adaptation of human groups, not of human beings. Human beings are aggressive, but they don't like killing each other. Governments, states, monarchs are quite happy to produce organizational forms that go to war or can receive external attack in order to protect the state, the organizational form, not any particular individual. So uh, institutions follow groups, is my answer to your question. But clearly, it needs thinking through in detail. You're, you, are you an anti-Turchin person? Have you read his stuff? Turchin. Yeah, Peter Turchin. Who? Peter Turchin, Russian. 
It's where I get all my stuff about myself from. Any final question? We have four minutes. There's one at the back. Okay, you um, When you first started out talking about the universe today, or the DNA, which I know you think, you think that's the end, you've always wanted to I do, don't I? Yeah, because I'm so English, aren't I? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Why should I say us and them? Because it sounds more about the phrase. It's a what? Well, that's, that's the phrase, isn't it? Us and them. Is it? Us and them. That's, that's glass. It's just I'm so old. Oh, <laughs> old. <laughs> um, that's versus where it can be conflict, conquest, all, all forms of cooperation. Yep. I find that that's difficult to... Grudging cooperation. Yeah. Mm. And that seems to relate to me rather to the idea of translation. Yes. So rather than just, and that's why the final word, so if you only have your list at the bottom, transmission at the end, yes. is whether or not it's important to recognise that translation often cannot be transmission. Because it is sometimes impossible to translate something. Yeah, Lotman would say always. Lotman's model of translation is that each system is untranslatable to the other. Yes, yeah, so is that true? Totally. Because you can have different kind of go-getters. Going, going too fast, sorry. But yes, totally, yeah. And also the whole thing about we and they, us and them. Um, yeah, the, the, it's, the accommodation to difference is the quarry of the, of the research. That's really what I'm trying to understand uh, and how it can be understood positively rather than catastrophically. But uh, you can't have one without the other. So you can't have you know, the new accommodation without the conflict and, and contest between the previous oppositions. And the contest part of it is, has a long history. So uh, where we get part of that idea from is uh, actually out of, a, out of a, uh, an, a, a, an attempt to understand what we, that is Jason and I, called waste, which is the, the ability of groups of many kinds, not just humans, to absorb unbelievable scales of waste in order to reproduce themselves. So pollen is a good example. Uh, and um, uh, humans are, are very wasteful of, for example, small humans and soldier humans and other kinds of humans in order to preserve group identities of various kinds. But eventually they may lose the contest and be taken over completely and all their knowledge absorbed into larger groups. That is conquest as cooperation. Now, it doesn't feel very good to the con conquered. You know, the Byzantines didn't feel wonderful when the Ottomans came along, but the Ottomans became Byzantine. So knowledge was transmitted through time, even to one's enemies, and became something different from what both of them had started out with. And it's that kind of accommodation that I'm most interested in exploring. So we and they is a partnership, not a win-lose partnership. But you can, only, you can only think that if you don't think about humans, if there's not a winner. Because all the, all the all heroes from the epic of Gilgamesh onwards die. That's what heroes do. <laughs> so it's not the individual survival that we're after. It's the city. <coughs> How does that survive? Well, it survives by wasting heroes. And in that process, knowledge is gained, alliances are made, marriages and all the rest of it, which can help the city to adapt and transform over time. And sometimes not. Sometimes they're blown to smithereens and reduced to dust. You know, that's, uh, that's part of an overall pattern of waste that needs explaining and you know, possibly regretting in certain cases. 
you don't remember an awful lot of empires that went around the ancient medieval world. We, we just don't know anything about them because they were destroyed by their enemies and their knowledge absorbed. So there is waste, there is loss, there is death, there is, you know, sacrifice and all those things. But the system as a whole has survived amazingly over that period. So that's what we're trying to explain. Okay, and that's it. I'm calling it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much.